Hey, it's Brandon Laws. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for the download today. Today's episode is brought to you by Zenium HR. Learn more about Zenium's complete HR plus payroll solution at zeniumhr.com. All right, today's episode features Jane Hansen. Jane is an Emmy award-winning television journalist and communications coach. And so we really dive deep into the nuances of effective communication. And in this episode, you're going to really discover key ways to successfully communicate with your colleagues, people in your life, from clarity and conciseness to body language and just all the unique challenges that some of the technology brings us in in this modern work environment. So you're going to hear a lot of really good tips from somebody who's a communications expert has been on TV and just knows exactly what she's talking about. So I hope you enjoy today's episode with Jane Hansen. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and would love a rating and review or share it with a colleague. That's the that's the best thing you could do is really share it with other people and let them know how you're liking the show. Thanks so much and have a great week. Enjoy the episode with Jane Hansen. Jane, it's a pleasure to have you on Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for coming on the show. You are very welcome. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. I'm excited to talk to you. You're a communication expert. You've been on TV for how many years? So you communicate for a living and you're now helping people communicate better. So I, I'm really excited to dive in. And you're, in all the years that you've been on, on TV uh, communicating, what are some of the, the, maybe the top three communication secrets that you've learned that have served you well in your career? Well, number one, you need to understand how to be really, really clear, have clarity in what you're saying, make sure you're understandable, and speak in words that resonate with your audience. So that leads to point number two is you have to know who your audience is. And that audience changes depending upon where you are, who you're with, what's their age, their gender, maybe their beliefs, uh, geography, all of that stuff kind of enters into it. You're not going to talk to a baby boomer like you're going to talk to a Gen Z. And so you got to think about that as you're getting into the hoping to, to, to really resonate. And then the last thing is thinking about how you're going to use your body language to truly emphasize what you're saying. Because we are people who have an innate sense of body language that we don't even realize. But I'm going to tell you right now, you make a judgment about every single person who comes into your life the moment you see them versus the moment they open their mouth and talk and start speaking. So you've got to be very conscious about all of those things in order to be a great communicator. How has the evolution of the media and technology, how has it changed the way and really shaped people's communication styles, whether at work or in our personal lives? Well, I think the the biggest, first of all, what everybody's doing when they're doing any kind of remote work, if they're doing a Zoom or a Google Meet or even a phone call, anything, well, especially if it has video to it, that's a tiny TV show. We're all doing TV. Let's just think about it that way. And so then that leads to all kinds of other elements, back to that body language thing, back to the way we look, our appearance. Television, I learned early on when I became a very young reporter, that the television camera drains you of 30% of your energy. So therefore, you have to amplify. You have to be more. And we need to do that on the Zoom because sometimes those things are deadly. And we've all been there and we all know it. And then we have to think about time and time management and and being conscious of how you have to really kind of make things smaller in a certain respect, make them more succinct. So you, and and we all know trying to squeeze 10 pounds of something in a five pound bag doesn't work very well. So all of that is what's affected us today. And we have no attention span. What do you think the entire, the attention span is in the U.S.? Uh, not, I, I don't know the, the data behind it, but I know it's not good. It's about eight seconds. Wow. Now, 
Now, and according to Microsoft, that is a second less than a time a goldfish takes to feed. Who measured that? I don't know, but somebody did. Um, so that means that now the engagement factor becomes so much more important. When I say attention span of eight seconds, people still will be listening, but it might mean that second conversation in the back of their head is going on, such as, what am I having for lunch? Or, mm. you know, something like that. Or even preparing to say their next line or something like that. They're probably yeah. thinking about what they're going to say next. Of course. And so that means we have to engage. That is a direct product of the overstimulation that we have in this world. I mean, come on. How many times do you look around and you see everybody's on their phones? And I'm always wondering, why are you on your phone versus speaking to the person who's sitting right in front of you? And what is so darn important that you got to be on that phone about it? I don't get it. Yeah, I don't either. I don't know. It's like maybe they get a hit of dopamine every time they see a notification or something like that. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but there's a there's a reason. There's a pattern that uh, most of us have experienced with just picking up our phone, checking out the dings, the notifications. It's very distracting when you're trying to have a conversation with somebody in front of you. Yeah, exactly. So, I do think that we could all take it down a notch, and that overstimulation leads to distractions. It leads to us maybe not thinking very clearly. It leads to just a whole host of things that are not very good. And then there's that whole factor of, who they have it so much better than I do, even though, uh, remember that the thing that used to be like, oh, I want what the Joneses have next door, keeping up with the Joneses. And now it's gone way beyond, gee, I want a car like them, or I wish my house looked like them. Now it's just everything is out there for us all to see. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of mistakes do you see people make when they communicate at work? I don't know if you've got a chance to observe a lot of people. You've probably experienced it in your, in your, your long career in, in TV, but what mistakes are people making from a communication standpoint? Well, you know, now I do communications coaching at a lot of corporations. Yeah. And what I see are mainly people not listening. They literally don't listen and then they don't ask. And in fact, I was having this whole discussion last week at one of the corporations I was at, where the boss was having a lot of trouble, that the CEO of the company was there to coach him because he was having communication issues with some of his employees. What was going on is that he would tell them about some expectation of how to do a project, and they wouldn't even listen fully. And then didn't do the project right and never bothered to say, I don't understand this clearly or asking a question out of fear that they might be put down for that. But if you don't ask, you're never going to find out what the truth is or the reality is. And so here's a, a really specific case of somebody delivering a message, the message not being understood, but the people who didn't understand it because of their relationship, they were the employee and not the boss, they were too afraid to ask for more information. Now, what should have happened in that case? The boss should have said, is everybody really clear on where we're going on this? And I'm happy to explain it with more clarity. So clearly, he wasn't being clear at the beginning. And then they, instead of admitting that they didn't know what to do, they just went off and said, oh, I think this is what it is. And they were wrong. And then they got into trouble because it wasn't what he expected. And, you know, the communication just went blah, 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 blah. It's like this, you know, just hands, nothing meeting. Yeah. Wow. You talked about the importance of body language. How do we go about being intentional about our body language in a conversation? Well, let's start with the eyes. How many times have you been standing someplace talking to someone in a room, a crowded room where there's perhaps a lot of other people and maybe it's an event of some sort and the person you're talking to is continually looking over your shoulder, right? This has happened, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I, it makes me feel uncomfortable. Right. So now you know, well, I'm not important to them because clearly they're waiting for somebody else more important to come in the door. Now, it could be that that other person truly is waiting for someone they're supposed to meet, but they should say that. They should say, now listen, I'm going to be looking, I have to keep looking because I'm, I'm waiting for this person who's new to the organization and I, I promised I would introduce them and I don't want them to walk in the door and feel uncomfortable. So if I keep looking over the shoulder, that's what I'm doing. I'm not trying to ignore you. 
But that's not what's usually going on. It usually is somebody thinking, Ooh, who else do I need to meet? Oh, I got to make sure I meet them. And it just puts the receiver in a bad light, but it also makes the person who's doing the talking feel really ignored and uncomfortable. And then, so have great eye contact. That's number one. Eyes are the gateway to the soul. And if you can't if you don't have the time to really have a conversation with that person, respect them enough to say, I would love to hear more. I can't do it right now because I've got to go over and speak to that person over there. I'm sorry. Could we set up another time to continue this conversation? So that gets to the very core of, I think, we need to have more of, which is simple respect. Yeah. You, you said earlier, I thought it was a really interesting data point. Uh, I hadn't thought about this, but on video and TV, in your case before, it drops your energy level by 30%. How do you intentionally bring out the energy like you described earlier? Are there tactics that you've used to make sure that you know, you're know you fully engaged in the conversation, that your energy level stays high? I, I think that's important in this remote work era that we're in with so many Zoom and video calls. So you do it with all of the things I'm talking about with the body language. So one is how you use your voice. Use your voice with more dynamism. What do I mean by that? I like to do a little exercise with people where I have them. I use a lot of video in my work. So I will have them deliver. Let's just say that we're working on a presentation of some sort. I'll have them deliver the presentation just as they normally would. And then I say, okay, now I want you to deliver the beginning of that presentation, but this time I want you to do it with being as passionate as you can and overly dramatic. I want you to feel really uncomfortable. So they do it. And then we play both presentations back. And what they'll discover is the second version where they were supposed to be overly dramatic, they listen to it and they go, wow, that was better than the first. And I'll say that's because you actually paid attention to emphasizing words, using pauses, being really energetic. And by the way, when I say, how uncomfortable were you? And they say, well, I was kind of uncomfortable. So I said, so here's the point. I don't expect you to be out there making yourself uncomfortable every single time you're delivering something. But I think what I just showed you is that by allowing yourself to be more excited, more passionate, it came across better. So there's a place that you can go to where you're not going to look silly or stupid, but you're going to be more energetic and thus I'm going to want to listen to you more. So that's one little trick. And people can do it by just practicing on their phone. Put your phone on record, set it someplace, and then do what I'm suggesting and look at the difference. Okay, so that's one. A second is um, using gestures. Now, when we're doing the virtual thing, Obviously, we usually only got a, a torso shot or, or maybe just our head and our chest. So you could either make a wider shot so you can use your hands or even if you just use your hands so they're out of the picture, it still brings your energy level up. It's still much more dynamic. So think about that. Um, and, and But they have to be in sync with your words. It's all just a conversation. So if we're going to make it a real conversation, we have to use our hands. But they can't be all over the place, though. They have to be really be used effectively, just like you do when you're talking to somebody. Yeah, you're making a great point earlier about uh, recording yourself because I like personally, I don't think my communication skills got as good as they did until I started listening to myself back on podcasts. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. used to edit all my own work. I don't do it anymore, but I would listen back to the nuances of my speech and I would then be intentional about the words I'm using, filler words and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I love that idea. Most people aren't comfortable seeing themselves either on video or listening to themselves. So how do you, how do you get over that? You just have to practice it. <laughs> right. I mean, you just, you just have to try. But the thing is, and here's, here's one of my other beliefs, is that this, it's a really great way of making yourself become a, a better speaker, a better conversationalist, a better communicator. 
But we are also self-critical. And frequently, when I show people a piece of video of themselves, when I'm coaching them, they'll say, ah, I hate the way I look. I hate my voice. I hate my gestures. I hate this. I hate that. So I say, you only get one. So let's just say that you're looking at your video and you say, I'm talking too fast. Okay. So this week, we're going to work on slowing down our conversation. And every single conversation you have, you're going to put in your head, I'm going to slow it down. So now, now you look at your video again a week later. And in that video, you say, man, I did a great job. I'm now slowing down. But what I'm seeing now is that my eye contact is all over the place. Okay, so this week, we're going to work on eye contact. So it's taking it step by step by step. Because if you try to do everything at once, you're just going to screw it up. So think about what can I do every single week or set yourself some kind of a goal. Maybe it's once a month, whatever it is, and then actually put it into practice. Today's landscape is, is very interesting with the rise of video because of YouTube, internet, TV, Zoom calls, videos like everywhere. So we need to, uh, you know, as individuals adapt to it, corporations are, are, are adapting to it. We're pretty video heavy. So how do we, how do we get better at using video to communicate ideas, uh, to communicate with each other individually? Just any thoughts on that, which is the, the changing landscape there? Well, as you can imagine, having been on television for most of my adult life, I love video. I believe video is an incredible way of learning and informing and you know, being able to, to really resonate with audiences. But most people don't use it very wisely. So first, think about what it is you want to say. What is the bottom line message that you have that you want someone to walk away with? And then make sure you reinforce it throughout whatever your video is. Think about, okay, so you've got your bottom line message. And then you have to prove that. So you prove it. There's, there's a thing called message development, um, having you know, a main message and then three points to prove it. And I don't want everybody to walk around the world going, okay, today I'm here to tell you that the world is round. Number one, the world is round because of A. Number two, the world. So, I mean, I'm not suggesting that that's what we do, but it's a little bit of a formula for helping simplify what you're saying and making sure that you're understandable. I mean, there's three main things that the father of communications, Aristotle, taught us. One, it's the power of connecting. And to connect really well, people have to believe that you know what you're talking about, and they have to trust you. That's number one. Number two, you have to be easy to understand. And so that gets back to who are you talking to, because you're going to talk differently to somebody who's 55 versus somebody who's 25. So now you've got to be easy to understand. And then the last thing is about feelings, the power of connecting and feelings. How are you making people feel? And I love this Maya Angela quote, which is, people will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did. They will never forget how you made them feel. And so anything you do, people are going to feel something, whether it's like that point of view is stupid or I, that is absolutely what I was thinking, or that gives me food for thought. Now I'm going to go investigate this further, or I feel really good about this, or I feel persuaded, or I feel informed, whatever it is. But people, so you have to think about how are you going to make people feel? And so all of that takes place in the course of a 10 second video, a TikTok video. Right. I mean, seriously, the impact is so phenomenal in a really, really short period of time. Yeah. So think about all of that. And I, I think it has to start with having a really clear message. Yeah. I was going to ask you just about the, the rise of in, the influencer uh, on social media and even mm -hmm. like for business leaders and CEOs who are out front in video. And it's just the media is just changed everything we have like we're more connected than ever what are the top qualities of those influencers like what are their how do they communicate and maybe it's just about connection and a simple message like you describe but are there other characteristics that some of the most powerful communicators have that the rest of us don't i think it's how they use their voice 
I think it's how they use their body language. And I also think it's how they display the confidence. A great example is the use of the pause, which I just did. And a pause is about the time it takes to tap your foot. And what a pause signifies, it gets people to pay attention. But I also think that they know what they want to say and they say it well. And they also, they're clever. And sometimes they're funny. And sometimes they're surprising. You never know what you're going to get. And I think that's a huge chunk of it as well. Great leaders have empathy and compassion for Mm -hmm. others. How do we communicate that? By being vulnerable, by being a great listener, by putting yourselves in the other person's shoes, by it not being all about us, but about being about them. There are countless examples of people who are considered to be phenomenal leaders who they walk into a room and they all they do is ask questions of people and they get to the bottom of people's stories and I have seen situations where because I do this myself I've seen situations where I will walk away and I'll hear somebody say isn't she phenomenal but they don't know a single thing about me because all the all I did was ask them questions about them. So it's really trying to and, and, and think about it. If you're a great leader, you have to learn what the perception of you is from other people because we are never perceived by other people the way we are perceived by ourselves. Never. So you have to see how other people perceive you. And you only find that out by asking a lot of questions. Do you have any memorable stories where empathy, compassion, asking questions the way you described it, transformed maybe a sticky, challenging interpersonal conflict? I have experiences with leaders and CEOs of companies where they had relationships that had real issues with either their direct reports or the board or people that worked for them. So when you walk in and you see the interaction, And when able to convince them that they need to go at it differently. And by going at it differently, what I mean by that is starting with this idea of respect. They may be the boss, but they better darn well respect the person that works for them. Um, I'll tell you one of the funny things that happens with me is I, so I go in to work with people and they feel like the reason I'm there to help with their presentations is because somebody's decided they're a bad presenter. So what do I say to them? I say, you're absolutely wrong, and here's why you're wrong. I am here because they have such faith in your abilities that they want to put you in an even more visible role. And they want you to learn how to deliver these messages in a way that always resonates. And so they're making an investment in you and your future. If they thought you sucked, I wouldn't be here. And you'd be fired. <laughs> so, but it's, I mean, because I, I have encountered that countless times where people think that there's, that it's a reflection of how, of how bad they might be doing instead of looking at it at the way of this is you being given an opportunity to really take your game up higher. Because the skills we're going to work on are going to help you move. They're going to help you move up. And that really is is an effective thing. And, you know, I I saw it as a reporter, too, where, like, think about things like labor negotiations for contracts or when there's, like, an enemy thing going on, maybe at the U.N., where people are talking to each other badly. And the moment that you can get in there and have them say, put yourself in their shoes— And think about what's really going on in somebody else's head. How can you show respect in that moment while not caving in? Because the world is, I mean, especially now, we're so polarized. And I think if we took an opportunity to really look at each other and talk to each other and think about, you have that empathy and that compassion and that belief that we have to understand And we have to speak in a way that helps us understand. It just moves mountains. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. If you look back at your entire career, you weren't always this great of a communicator, I'm sure. And you probably had to reinvent yourself several times. And you probably had to build a bunch of skills. What were some of the biggest moments of your career where something clicked 
or you built certain skills and I just maybe just share how you grew and developed because I'm sure people listening can really get use from some of that um, just what you've been through well when I was first on TV um, I remember that I would go in the ladies room and stand in front of the bathroom <laughs> and watch myself and just say lines over and over and over again. I also looked at tapes consistently to say mm-hmm. this, this was good. This was bad. Why did you deliver this? Why did you have that weird facial expression? That kind of thing. Um, when I was, would go out and give, I did a lot of speeches and emceeing. I mean, I still do speeches, emceeing, um, moderating panels, that kind of thing. And one of the things that I learned to do was when I would be getting ready to go do a speech, for example, or MC an event, and I would get there early and I would talk to people about, you know, what were their expectations for the evening or why were they there or why were they devoted to this particular cause or what were they, what did they hope to get out of it? And then I would incorporate some of that into the beginning of my speeches because it made people feel that I cared. And then, of course, interviewing hundreds of thousands of people as I have, I had to learn how I could reach them in a way that would touch them enough so that I would get a really good answer. And by the way, one of the things I discovered is interviewing people is not about asking questions. It's about listening to answers. That's 100% true. I mean, I've done, I've not interviewed quite as many people as you, but in, in all the podcasts that I've done, 450, and I've moderated a lot of panels, what I've understood is like going in with a plan is, is good, but going in with the script is not so great because if you're going to just follow that and it's really rigid, you're not going to listen to what they're saying as much. And it's, it's going to come off that way. It's going to be question, answer, question, answer, question, answer versus like really getting into the nuance of what they're saying and, and diving a little deeper than you otherwise would. How did you build those skills because that's that's really tough like for for somebody who might be nervous going into something like that where they're asking a lot of questions seeking to understand but uh, just haven't had the practice doing it like that it's a skill in itself one of the things you need to remember is that it's all just a conversation and we get ourselves into oh now I'm the moderator oh I must have to I have to talk like this instead of recognizing that it's really just a conversation so you focus on your purpose why are you there and you're usually there because you you want to share information And if you're the one who's giving the presentation or giving the speech or being interviewed, that means in that moment in time, you are the expert on whatever subject it is. Now, if you're the panel member or the moderator, the moderator's job is to be like a conductor and to get, you know, to make something dynamic and exciting. And so you just have to build off of everything. I've had many interviews where I have done a ton of prep work And I have literally thrown every question out the window because somebody says something so interesting that you just go down a different garden path and it makes it a great interview. I think we forget that all we're doing is talking to another human being. And if you have a lot of curiosity and you know enough about the subject to be able to to kind of dig a little bit deeper. And you know what my favorite question is? No, what is it? Why? Why? (laughs) It's like a child. Like I've got kids and and they ask why, why, why? And it it goes, you go layers deep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yep. It's like the journalism, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And I get the best answers when I just, I just, you know, I lean in, I look somebody in the face and I say, why? And it's just amazing what happens. Yeah. I think of, this is an interview, a podcast interview, but I think of like manager employee relationships, the question of why, and even seeking to understand and asking questions like that. It's useful in that situation as well, really getting to know somebody and and what makes them tick and better connection when you ask the right questions, right? Yeah. The more you know about someone, the better relationship you can have. And the world is full of relationships. And when you know things, it makes you I think it makes all of us better. Yeah, I agree. The one thing that comes up for me is in this now with all the technology options and the ways in which we can communicate, we don't always have the opportunity to have an in-face uh, or Zoom call. And sometimes people hide behind text and email. Ugh, I hate that. What's the right? Yeah, so what's the right approach to communicating, especially if somebody 
defaults to text or email. I think text is somebody being a real chicken, especially if it's an important message. Yes. And Amen. I, because there's so much room for misinterpretation. And I hate that. I hate them. I think text just, ugh. I mean, they're really good for the information that you need to have in a, in a, in a moment, like, like meet me at 32nd and 4th or whatever it is. Or, Tra- transactional. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm, I'm stuck in traffic. I'm sorry. I'm going to be 15 minutes late. But otherwise, it kind of gets down to respect. How much do you really care about somebody if all you're going to do is tell them it through text? Yeah, nowadays, when I'm trying to communicate an idea or bring somebody along with my beliefs or, or whatever it may be, I've defaulted. There's so many great tools out there. I use a tool called Loom for recording videos. Mm-hmm. And instead of an email, if I, if I find myself writing an, an email trying to communicate something to my team, I might just record a video of my face and and explain uh, in addition to maybe text that goes in an email, but I, I've found that very powerful because you get the the nuance of the speech. They can see my body language and face. I mean, there's there's no excuses anymore, right, Jane? Right, right, <laughs> exactly. I love that. I think that's such a great idea. You asked me earlier about video. There's nothing that can be misunderstood. If you're doing the video that says, hey, guys, I wanted to give you some details about the new project we're working on. We're going to be doing it five days a week. We're going to tape it at two o'clock in the afternoon. It's going to have blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, if you just go through this whole thing, you, they can't misunderstand it. In a text, they're going to go, what? What's he saying? And it, it just, I don't know. I just wish that we all, that we all just took the time to communicate better. I so agree. Well, Jane, I've loved this conversation. Thanks for coming on the the show. Where can people learn more about you, your work? I know you're helping a lot of people become better communicators. So maybe share a little bit about that. Okay. Well, it's really easy. My website is janehanson.com, H-A-N-S-O-N.com. And um, they can email me at jane at janehanson.com. And I'm on Twitter and I'm on, oh wait, it's not Twitter. It's X. I keep forgetting. Sorry. X. Sorry. Hey, that's X. hard. That's a bad um, habit. Yeah. And then there's I, my Instagram is at Jane Hanson official. I'm on Facebook. I'm all over the place. LinkedIn. I'm all over. We'll put links to all of those in the show notes. Jane, it's been a pleasure having you on Transform Your Workplace. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the guest's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Zenium HR or the host, Brandon Laws. The material and information presented on Transform Your Workplace is for general information and educational purposes only. Zenium HR or the host, Brandon Laws, does not necessarily endorse any guest, their business, or any organization they represent. Discretion is advised. Please work with a trusted advisor to find a custom approach that fits your organization's needs.